I'm Rakesh Sood, and I have the privilege to talk about Nepal and India's relationship with Nepal from the time of not just 1947, but even earlier. In fact, there are no two countries that have probably enjoyed a closer and a more complex relationship than India and Nepal. And yet, it has not been an easy relationship. In modern terms, one would say that Nepal came into being in 1768. Before that, it had been a collection of small kingdoms. It was Prithvi Narayan Shah, who was actually the king of Gurkha. Gurkha is a place in Nepal, it's actually a district. And he decided to consolidate. And by 1768, he had taken over the valleys of Kathmandu which at that time consisted of three separate kingdoms. He then embarked on an expansion where he came up against the British India and the British Indian Army. He expanded all the way to Bhutan in the east, taking over parts of Sikkim and West Bengal. And to the west, he expanded all the way up to the Satluj River. Finally, the British thought that they had had enough of him. And so they went to war in 1814 with the descendants of Prithvi Narayan Shah, who had established the Shah dynasty, which lasted for 240 plus years. The war with the Anglo-Nepal war lasted for two years. And finally, in 1816, the Treaty of Sugoli was signed in North Bihar. And the British imposed a heavy penalty on Nepal. They, Nepal lost about one third of its territory and was restored to its original boundaries, which last to this day. Subsequently, Nepal had a number of young princes who were made into kings, but the rule was essentially exercised by the regents or by the courtiers. And most of them belonged to the various Brahmin clans, Thapas, and Pandes and Basnets and so on. 1846 stands out as a major year in Nepal's history. That was a time when there was a massive court massacre, which is known as the court massacre. More than 40 or 50 senior courtiers were killed. And that is how the Rana regime was established. Jang Bahadur Rana was there with his soldiers. He was prepared for the massacre and he almost single-handedly wiped out the Thapa and the Pande clans. Jang Bahadur Rana took some time to consolidate himself. He was uh, an intelligent and an ambitious man. What he did was he realized that he needed to have a lineage. So while he became the prime minister and there was the Shah dynasty that continued as king, what Jang Bahadur Rana did was he appointed his various brothers and cousins into key positions as governors and army chiefs and so on. Not only that, in order to embellish his lineage, he made his position a hereditary position as much as the king's position was a hereditary position. He got the king to award him parts of Nepal so that he could also crown himself like a small king. So if the king of Nepal was addressed as Shri, 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 Shri five times, he insisted that he should now be addressed as a junior king by Shri, Shri, Shri three times. And that is how he established the Rana regime. The Rana regime lasted from 1846 till 1950, which is quite a long time. During this process, it may be worthwhile to take a look at what constitutes the population of Nepal, because although it is a small country, it is actually a highly diverse country given its geography. Broadly speaking, Nepal has always been ruled by the Khas Arya, or what is called the Bahun Chetri hill tribes. Bahun and Chetri would be the equivalent of Brahmin and Khatri, as we would call it. These constitute about 30% of Nepal's population. And the surnames are Shahs, Ranas, Thakuris, Pandes, and so on. Most of them trace their descent from Rajasthan or from the hill areas of Uttarakhand. 
Then there are the indigenous hill tribes who are called the Janjatis. They constitute another 30 percent. You have them between the Gandak and Karnali river basins about known as the Magars and the Gurungs. And then in the eastern part, you have them, the Rais, the Limbus and the Tamangs. The third component of Nepal's population are the Madhesis. The Madhesis also include the Dalits and the Muslims and also the indigenous tribals from the plains known as the Tharus. Together, they constitute about 35 percent of the population. It is with the Madhesis that traditionally India has had the closest of relationship, particularly the northern areas of UP and Bihar. In fact, the common phrase that is often used to describe this relationship is roti beti ka rishta. Now, both the Janjatis and the Madhesis have traditionally been the marginalized communities because the ruling class always came from the Bahun Khetris. Till 1958, in fact, the Madhesis needed a permit to travel to Kathmandu Valley. The composition of the Madhes underwent a major change in 1963. Till that time, Nepal consisted of about 32 districts. And the districts bordering India were largely Madhes majority districts. In 1963, King Mahendra decided to redistribute the districts, increase the number to 76. And what he did was that he, the Madhes based districts were increased to nearly 20 and the foothills was brought in. Now with that, a Pahari population started becoming part of these districts. And therefore, by the time he had finished, out of the bordering districts that bordered India, there were only eight which had a Madhes majority. And that, in a sense, sowed the seeds for federalism, which we find reflected in today's constitution. Incidentally, Nepal has not been a stranger to constitution writing. The first constitution was proclaimed by the then Prime Minister Padma Shamsher Rana in 1948, but it could not be implemented as he was soon overthrown by his cousin Mohan Shamsher Rana. He introduced an interim constitution in 1951 that led to the first election. And finally, there was a new constitution in 1959. However, things moved pretty quickly thereafter. In 1962, the king brought about a new constitution where he abolished political parties and introduced what was called as Panchayati Raj or grassroots democracy. This continued till the first Janandolan in 1990 when there was a big political upheaval in Nepal, leading to the 1990 constitution, which actually limited the role of the monarchy to being a constitutional monarchy and established multi-party democracy. Many people think that, 1990, with, that with 1990, the constitution writing in Nepal would have come to an end. But unfortunately, that was not to be. Nepal was soon engulfed in a massive Maoist insurgency, which lasted for a decade. By the time the Maoist insurgency ended, Nepal was ready for yet another interim constitution, which came about in 2007. And finally, that led to the final constitution, which exists today, which was promulgated on 20th September 2015. So in a sense, the democratic transition of Nepal has now been underway for nearly three decades. It began in 1990. And since that time, Nepal has had about 26 prime ministers. As you can guess, not a single one of them would have been able to complete his term. In fact, many of them were only there for a limited period. In the middle, there was also direct rule by the then King Gyanendra. The period of the Maoist insurgency from the mid-1990s till about 2005 claimed 15,000 lives. The politics of that period was even more complicated when the palace massacre took place in 2001. 
In 2001, the crown prince, Prince Dipendra, at a family dinner get together in the palace, came down with a number of automatic weapons and proceeded to shoot all his relatives, which included his father, the then king, his mother, and a number of uncles and aunts. Many people describe this as literally the end of the monarchy. Crown Prince Dipendra, who would normally have been executed for having raised a gun to the king, the monarch, had actually gone and shot himself and was in coma. So interestingly, he was crowned king for three days while he continued to be in coma. And when he passed away, he was given a royal cremation and his uncle Gyanendra was then crowned king. There used to be an old prophecy about Prithvi Narayan Shah, who had established the monarchy in Nepal. The prophecy went something like this. There was an Indian ascetic by the name of Goraknath, and actually people say that the Gurkha kingdom takes its name from Goraknath. Now apparently Prithvi Narayan Shah, as a young child, had met this ascetic Goraknath, Baba Goraknath as he was called, and at some point, he was asked to, the Baba Goraknath was asked to pronounce about this young boy's future. The young boy happened to spill some yogurt on the floor, which dirtied Baba Goraknath's feet, all toes and thumb. Baba Goraknath said that Prithvi Narayan Shah will consolidate the kingdom and 10 generations subsequently would continue to rule the kingdom. As it happens, this was precisely the 10 generations that ruled Nepal for 241 years. Because Gyanendra then presided over the elimination of monarchy and the declaration of Nepal as a republic in 2008. 2008 saw the rise of two new political phenomena in Nepal. One was the rise of the Maoists who had now reached a peace agreement and therefore were going to be brought into the political processes. And the second was the rise of the Madhesis as a political force. As I mentioned earlier, Madhesis were the people living in the Tarai who had traditionally been marginalized, but now they were going to assert their political identity. The Maoist leader was Pushpakamal Dahal, popularly known as Prachand, which was his nom de guerre. Prachand actually became the Prime Minister of Nepal in 2008 and at that time the mandate of the new Constituent Assembly was to complete a new constitution within two years. However, Prachand failed to make the transition from being a guerrilla leader to a politician and therefore very soon his coalition broke down and eventually he had to resign. The Constituent, the Constituent Assembly, which had a mandate for two years, got four extensions and went up till 2013 when finally the Supreme Court stepped in and ordered fresh elections. The fresh elections changed the political complexion of Nepal once again. The Maoists came down from a massive majority of 229 seats in 2008 to 80 seats five years later, thanks to Prachanda's mismanagement, and the Madhesis came down from 84 seats to 40, thanks to their internal bickering and fracturing. The winners in this process were the two established political parties, the Nepali Congress and the UML, or the United Marxist-Leninist, which was a precursor to the Maoist movement and had been in existence for, by that time, for about six decades. Once again, the constitution writing process began in earnest. But once again, there was greater interest in looking at power play and looking at positions of authority. All this changed with the earthquake in April 2015, which was one of the worst in Nepal's history. The estimated financial loss was something like $7 billion. 9,000 people lost their lives. It is estimated that 7 lakh people were pushed below the poverty line. 
The international community rushed in with assistance, except that they found a very dysfunctional government in Kathmandu. That is what led to a hasty process of decision making in order to complete the constitution. Interestingly, the three main parties, whether the Maoists or the United Marxist-Leninists or the Nepali Congress, all three were led by Bahun Chetri elite. And in their rush to complete the constitution, they failed to take into account the reservations of the marginalized communities. The new constitution was adopted on 13th of September 2015. A number of groups actually boycotted the session. And that is the time when India once again started being active. The then Foreign Secretary was dispatched post haste to Kathmandu as a special envoy of the, foreign, of the Prime Minister on 18th and 19th of September 2015. The message was very clear. The message was to delay the promulgation of the constitution so that all views could be taken on board. But it was seen as blatant interference by the Nepali elite. And the promulgation of the new constitution was announced for 20th September, the day after the special envoy returned to Delhi. However, there was very little joy and celebration which would normally accompany such an event. By this time, the Tarai was in flames, riots were breaking out, and transport across the border was coming to a standstill. What had happened between India and Nepal is something that we can explore a little later. But meanwhile, the understanding between the political parties in 2015 was that once the constitution was adopted, there would be a handing over of power. The handing over of power never took place. As a result, India was once again blamed for having blocked the handing over of power. By this time, nearly 50 people had lost their lives in the Tarai agitation. There were people who were camping in what is known as the no man's land between India and Nepal. This is a piece of land which is just about 10 yards wide. In fact, popularly it is called Das Gaja. There was a complete shortage of essentials. Petroleum products, medicines were in short supply. A liter of petrol cost about 300 rupees and there were mile long queues outside petrol pumps. People were paying as much as 4,000 rupees for an LPG cylinder. The Nepali Prime Minister KP Oli called it an act more inhumane than war. Perhaps this marked a new low in India-Nepal relations. Nepali elites called the Indian action a blockade, while the Indian government continued to insist that it was a disruption in supplies caused by the law and order problem in the Tarai. The situation eventually was eased after a set of constitutional amendments were pushed through by February 2016. According to some Nepali economists, the Indian action resulted in another 5 lakh people being pushed below the poverty line. Finally, the Oli government collapsed under the weight of its own contradictions when the Maoist leader Prachanda backed out because he was offered the prime ministership and this time with the support of the Nepali Congress. Prachanda continued as prime minister in his second term for about eight, nine months and handed over the reins to the Nepali Congress, which then conducted a fresh set of elections in November of 2017. By this time, the new provinces, the demand for federalism that had been made had to be addressed. And by this time, seven new provinces had been carved out. The election in November 2017 was going to be the first election in a country as a republic. Interestingly, even as the Maoists were in a coalition government with the Nepali Congress, they actually were forming a new electoral alliance with the UML. And as a result, once the elections were announced, 
they ended up forming a joint front which won them a handsome victory. The UML Maoist combine actually ended up winning six out of seven provinces. One province went to the Madesis. They also won something like 174 seats out of 275. And once again, in February of 2018, Oli emerged as the newly elected prime minister. He is about to complete two years. And one reason why we have not seen any politics in the last two years is because the new constitution of Nepal bans any no confidence motion for a period of two years. Once these two years are over, we will probably see how the politics of Nepal is going to emerge. So 2020 is going to be a very interesting year for the politics of Nepal. As I mentioned earlier, India has had a complicated relationship with Nepal. A close relationship, but nonetheless a complicated one. Perhaps it is also a legacy of the colonial past. And nowhere is this better reflected than in the history of the 1950 India-Nepal Peace and Friendship Treaty and the myths that continue to surround it. One of the myths that exists in Nepal is that this is a treaty that was foisted by India on Nepal. Nothing could be further from the truth. The actual fact is that the Rana regime, remember I mentioned that the Ranas were the de facto rulers of Nepal since 1846. The Rana regime was actually keen to preserve the same relationship with independent India as they had preserved with British India. There had been a series of agreements beginning with the Treaty of Sugoli of 1816, emerging till 1923 with what was the precursor to the 1950 Peace and Friendship Treaty. The Ranas approached the Indian Embassy and the Government of India to work on a new treaty and drafts were exchanged. By middle of 1950, a new treaty had been signed. Essentially, this provided for equal treatment for Nepali citizens in India. In other words, Nepali citizens in India could come and join work or open businesses and they would enjoy the same treatment as Indian nationals. The 1950 Peace and Friendship Treaty also cemented the open border that had traditionally existed between India and Nepal. Till 1990, the border was such that Nepal did not even have a police force on the border. It was only after 1990 that Nepal started posting security forces on the Indian border. We ourselves placed the SSB, the Sashastra Seema Bal, on the India-Nepal border in 2001. That was the kind of open border which still continues to be as open because it provides for visa-free entry. And on any particular day, you will have the Madesis traveling back and forth between India and Nepal. If there is a better school on the Indian side, then you will find that the Nepali children would all be studying in that school. If there is a better hospital or a better doctor on the Nepali side, you will find that all the Indians would be going across to that particular hospital. Nepali citizens today can apply for all Government of India jobs except for the IAS, the IPS and the Indian Foreign Service. In fact, we have had Nepali citizens joining NDA and rising to be one and two star generals of the Indian Army. One of the other things that had happened after the Treaty of Sugoli of 1816 was that the British decided to recruit Gurkhas into their regiment. In 1947, India inherited many of these regiments. Some went to Singapore, Hong Kong, and to UK. We entered into a trilateral agreement to continue the recruitment of Nepali Gurkhas into the Indian Gurkha regiments. And to date, we recruit about 1,500 Nepali Gurkhas to the Indian Gurkha regiments. Not only that, the Army Chief of Nepal 
is an honorary general of the Indian Army and Nepal returns the honor by having the Indian Army chief as an honorary general of the Nepal Army. However, Nepal has always been conscious of its geography. The founder of Nepal, Prithvi Narayan Shah, he had coined the famous phrase of describing Nepal as a yam between two boulders. He was referring to the British Indian Empire on one side and the Tibetan Kingdom on the other side. Nepali politicians continue to be seduced by the same phrase, not realizing that perhaps the world has changed. It is no longer an imperial world. But such is the power of myth-making of history. Another power, another powerful myth in Nepal that we come across is that while India was colonized for centuries, Nepal was never colonized and had actually defeated the British. The myth of the invincible Gurkha assumes greater and greater profile. Yet, what it tends to hide is the fact that Nepal had agreed to peace under somewhat less than equal terms because the British had made Nepal into a buffer between Tibet and India, something that they did as well with Afghanistan by settling the Afghan border called the Duran Line. Here, the British also introduced the institution of posting a political agent in Kathmandu who was supposed to, quote, advise the Nepal palace on all matters relating to foreign affairs and security. Just after India signed the India-Nepal Friendship Treaty in 1950, there was a major political upheaval. King Tribhuvan, who was the then king of Nepal, and was chafing under the bit from the Rana oppression. The Ranas were the titular prime ministers and also controlled all other important positions. The king was, came out for religious ceremonies and for ceremonial, other such ceremonial functions. In November of 1950, King Tribhuvan with his family was going for a picnic. But instead of continuing with the picnic, he turned his cars into the Indian Embassy compound and sought asylum. It was a major challenge for the newly emerged government of India, which had just four months earlier signed the India-Nepal Peace and Friendship Treaty. The Ranas had probably thought that by signing that treaty, the Indian government would have the same relationship with them, but the Congress government had had closer ties with the emerging Nepali Congress and it was imbued with the desire to see social reform. As a result, King Tribhuvan and his family flew to Delhi and subsequently went back after a new agreement was breached with the Rana regime in which their powers were decimated. The palace was restored to greater power and in turn, the palace had to agree to the role of political parties. This was perhaps the first major intervention that India took in Nepal in the interests of promoting democracy in Nepal. There have been subsequent interventions too. However, it did not necessarily go down very well. And what it led to was a growing sense of anti-Indianism, which was capitalized on initially by the palace and subsequently by virtually all the political leaders. Traditionally, just as King Tribhuvan found asylum in India, his successors, the political leaders of Nepal, also found asylum in India, whether it was the Nepali Congress or for that matter, whether it was the Maoist leaders. There was no Maoist leader who went and sought refuge in China strangely enough, but they all came and lived in India thanks to the open border and the equal treatment provisions. Another myth about the 1950 Peace and Friendship Treaty is that there were secret side letters that were exchanged. There was a letter that was exchanged 
and it was not at that time listed publicly, but it was subsequently made public by the 1960s. Essentially, that letter said that Nepal would consult India in case its security was threatened. Second, that Nepal would also consult with India in terms of imports of any military equipment that it would seek and it would be brought through India. And finally, it said that while India and Nepal under the Peace and Friendship Treaty had agreed to equal treatment to each other's citizens, India, given its larger size, was waiving its right to reciprocity. In other words, Indian citizens were not going to have the right of residence or right of employment in Nepal, which Nepali citizens continue to enjoy to date. The final point was that in case there were mineral reserves discovered in Nepal which were to be exploited, India would have the first option. That did not eventually happen, but what the secret side letter did was that it established a conspiracy theory around the India-Nepal Treaty, which has continued to date. Ironically, for the last 20 years, India has been ready to review and update the treaty, but yet each time the Nepali government, while making a public hue and cry about it, has been extremely reluctant to undertake any revision of this treaty. These conspiracies often tap into an anti-Indian narrative. King Mahindra was quite an astute observer of the regional political situation. He recalled his forefather's adage of a yam between two boulders. That is, in 1962, that he discarded the old constitution and brought in the new constitution banning political parties. He also tried to build up the left parties in Nepal. He urged the Nepali left or the Nepali communist parties to also align with him rather than with the Nepali Congress. These conspiracies also led to the anti-Indian narrative. We can recall that in 2001, riots broke out when Ritrik Roshan made anti-Nepali remarks in a TV interview. The whole episode was then proved to be a hoax and completely baseless. In 1999, Madhuri Dikshit said that Nepal seemed very much like India, which was interpreted by Nepali nationalists as a sign of Indian expansionism. In 2009, when I happened to be there, there was a film released called Chandni Chok to China. And in this film, one of the characters says at a time, Buddha was born in India. This was seen yet another sign of India wanting to take over Lumbini. The most recent controversy has been this year, after India issued new maps following the reorganization of the state of Jammu and Kashmir, these new maps actually divided the state of Jammu and Kashmir into union territories and had nothing to do with the India-Nepal boundary. And yet, the India-Nepal boundary became a controversy in Nepal because of the fact that they claimed that Susta and Kalapani, which are two small territories, uh, which are holdovers from the earlier boundary agreements, were being annexed by India as an act of cartographic aggression. In fact, Susta and Kalapani are holdovers precisely because of shifting rivers and the Susta is a small river on the border in the Tarai and Kalapani relates to the precise geographical location of the origin of the Mahakali River. Even as the political mistrust continued, very soon the Nepali rupee was pegged to the Indian rupee as a means of strengthening the Nepali rupee. Two-thirds of Nepal's foreign trade is with India. India also accounts for half of Nepal's foreign direct investment. India has built highways, optical fiber links, medical colleges, polytechnics, schools, dams, health centers, bridges. We also provide pensions and other welfare measures for the ex-servicemen, numbering about 125,000 who live in Nepal. It is estimated that Nepal sits on about 60,000 megawatts of hydropower, which is both economically viable and technically feasible. The domestic production of hydropower in Nepal is about 800 megawatts. And during the lean season, 
Nepal actually has to import electricity from India. Yet, the backdrop of the Kosi Agreement and the Gandak Agreement going back to the 1950s and 60s is such that there have been no hydro power developments. It is quite clear that if there is a hydro potential in Nepal which is going to be exploited, the electricity would have to be exported to India which could actually make Nepal an extremely rich country, something that we see being done with Bhutan very, very successfully. Demonetization added another irritant into our relationship with Nepal. When we demonetized 500 and 1000 rupee notes overnight, there were a lot of Nepali citizens who legitimately held this currency because it was Nepali citizens are allowed to hold Indian currency up to a certain limit. The same was true with Bhutan as well, but with Bhutan we've been able to solve the problem. However, it is estimated that the Nepal Central Bank today is carrying about 800 to 900 crores of old demonetized currency, which actually is a tiny amount compared to the 13 or 14 lakh crores that were exchanged in India. But we still have not been able to resolve this. How India and Nepal will sort out their growing political irritants in future will depend also on the entry of a new actor into the equation. And that is China. Remember I mentioned that beginning with King Mahendra in the 1960s, Nepali leaders have been quick to exercise the China card. In the past, the Chinese leaders would often advise the Nepali leaders to sort out their differences with India bilaterally. But today's China is a different China. It's a more assertive China. It is a China that is already making its presence felt not just in the South China Seas, but also in the Indian Ocean, in the South Asian neighborhood of India, and further afield with its ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. Even though China and Nepal have had diplomatic relations since 1955, the first visit of the Chinese Defense Minister took place in March of 2017 to Kathmandu. He announced a military grant of $32 million. For the first time later that year, Nepal and China held a joint military exercise. Traditionally, China has had certain security concerns because of the presence of Tibetan refugees in Nepal. There are today about 20,000 Tibetan refugees. And very often, for China, this is a security-related issue. Traditionally, China felt that its security concerns with regard to the Tibetan refugees could be addressed by having a close link with the palace. But now, the palace is no more, and Nepal is a republic. Therefore, China has now decided to deal directly with the security agencies, including the Nepal army, which has traditionally enjoyed the closest of relationships with India and also with the political parties. It has built a training academy for the Nepal Armed Police Force. After Prime Minister Oli felt that he had been rebuffed by India during 2015 by the Indian blockade, which he described as an inhumane act of war, he turned increasingly to China there was a symbolic consignment of a thousand tons of petroleum products that was brought in over the Nepal-Tibet border into Kathmandu. Subsequently, after his election in 2017, he has built closer ties with China and is keen to operationalize a new transit and transport agreement that he had signed earlier. The protocol for the agreement which provides for railway using rail services across the Chinese uh, territory and bring them all the way up to the Nepal territory is gradually going to take shape. At present, it hardly seems to be economical. The kind of investment that would be needed to bring the railway line from Shigatse to Kerung on the border and then down to Kathmandu is estimated at something like four to five billion dollars. And even then, it is unlikely to be economical. Yet, we also saw 
The Chinese President Xi Jinping visited Kathmandu in October of this year. Nepal has been welcomed as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And during Xi Jinping's visit, there were nearly 20 agreements and MOUs signed, promising a potential investment of over $7 billion. However, what is interesting is that while China was interested in signing an extradition treaty on account of its concerns about the Tibetan refugees, at the last minute, the Nepalese demurred, which did not make Xi Jinping particularly happy. Coupled with the opening up of politics in Nepal under the new constitution, and with a more assertive China, it will remain to be seen how best we are able to implement the policy that was so eloquently described by Prime Minister Modi as neighborhood first.